uh, some of the do's and don'ts uh, of resume writing. And then we'll talk about uh, basic techniques to highlight your international experience. Everyone, you're probably all well used to hearing that you don't have Canadian experience. So we're going to talk about how to overcome that a little bit. Um, first things first, a little bit about me. So I'm originally from Ar Ireland. I'm an immigrant um, like you. Um, I moved here in 2008. Um, I initially worked in finance, but then in 2011, 2012, I decided to reinvent myself in Canada and basically dedicate my, I suppose, basically dedicate my professional life to working with newcomers. Um, I was working in finance. I didn't get a lot of satisfaction from helping the top 2% in the world get richer. And I uh, felt a bit of a need to do something more productive with my time. So that kind of prompted me to create moving to Canada was the first idea we created. Uh, the focus there was empowering newcomers to achieve success. That may sound a little bit vague, but every one of you has a very different uh, measurement or vision of success in Canada. For some people, it's getting here. It's uh, leaving, leaving an unstable environment. Uh, for other people, it's career success. For other people, it's all about their kids. So we're just acknowledging that people have very different um, ideas of what success looks like. But we're all newcomers and moving to Canada is all about empowering you. What we mean by empowering you is we don't do a lot of hand-holding. We don't offer concierge advice. You don't pay us for consulting. We just give you everything that you need. And it's up to you to do the work from there on. So we're all about giving you the tools and uh, the content to empower your um, your success in Canada. I also created Outpost Recruitment at the time. Outpost was designed to be a matchmaker between global talent and Canadian construction firms. So my original business idea, two of my brothers were engineers and one of them followed me to Canada. I kept hearing about the labor shortage. And after helping my brother find a job when he came to Canada, I realized I can do this. So I just realized I had no construction experience, no recruitment agency experience, but I just had no business experience. So I combined them all together in 2012 and I just took a leap of faith and um, it paid off. <laughs> so in 2019, I was awarded Best Immigrant Entrepreneur by Small Business BC. 2021, I was named as uh, one of Canada's top 25 immigrants. And in 2022, I was uh, named at a top 40 under 40 in Canadian construction. Um, these are interesting accolades. I'm particularly proud of the last one, given I never worked in construction. I was never an engineer. So learning enough to convince my peers that I was worthy of being a, a young leader in construction was quite the accolade for me. But I suppose the thing I want to kind of resonate is in, you know, we always talk about success with these and we'll always talk about success in your job hunt looking back in it. But behind a lot of these things, there was a lot of hard work. There was a lot of failure. There was a lot of learning. So I've had failures. Uh, I've failed in a marathon. I failed at uh, 1.4 kilometers at a Vancouver marathon last year. I, I collapsed. I've had relationship failures and I've had business failures over the last few years. But uh, we tend to celebrate the successes. They're more public. But what I want you to take away from today is it's okay to fail and just accept it and learn from it because you're going to have failures over the next few months in Canada. And that's it's it's all about how you embrace that failure. Um, a slide here in the current state of play. So what's happening? Okay, so first of all, you've made it to Canada. I think that's, you know, it's uh, immigration, it's a very bold move. You're basically starting a new life in a new country. So I think you all deserve a lot of credit for making this happen. For some of you, it might've just happened six months ago and for others, it, it, you've been planning this for three or four years. So um, I suppose kudos in getting to Canada, but there's a lot of work to do from here in terms of building your dream life here. And there's a lot of resources available between ISS and moving to Canada and various other resources. What's happening right now is there's a huge disconnect between our immigration system and the labor market. We're inviting all of these skills to come to Canada. You have enough points in express entry, and then you believe that, hey, I've been offered permanent residency. There's got to be a job for me in Canada. Um, what's actually happening is it's extremely hard to find your first role in Canada. Um, so that's the reality that you're all facing. We can blame the system, we can blame employers, or we can blame ourselves. And the truth is, it's a little bit of all three. So there's 
progress to be made with foreign credentials by policymakers. Employers need to open their eyes a little bit and realize that somebody without lo local experience will quickly gain that local experience if given the right opportunity. And newcomers also need to learn how to stop sabotaging their own job search. Um, that's the thing, the one thing that you're in control of today. And I want you all to kind of leave with a message that I'm in control of my success. I can actually figure out my fate in Canada. Um, what I mean by sabotaging your job search is I look at resumes all day long. I'm hiring for moving to Canada roles. We've got 14 employees. Um, I'm a recruiter. The standard of resumes I see from newcomers is absolutely awful. So what's happening is they are not learning to adapt to what they're doing in Canada, right? So we've you've done all this work in making it to Canada, but then what we're doing is we're not realizing that our adaptability is the critical factor in a new environment. We're out of our old environment and we're now in a new environment. So it's not about what you know in your, in your um, home country. It's about what you can adapt to and what you can convince others on in terms of your ability to adapt in Canada. That's great. I just want to stop you there for one second, Rory, because you just in the first few minutes here, you've made some really um, important points. Um, the number one, I think that I took is it's okay to fail. I think that one of the things that I see so often, one thing I love is the resilience that I see of newcomers who, who have come here and are trying again and again, but rejection is in your future for right now. Um, and, and the better that you can adapt to that and the better that you can continue to pick yourself back up, I think the better you're going to do in your job search. And despite the labor shortage, it is really hard to find work in Canada, whether it is an entry level position that you're just trying to get. So you get that Canadian experience on your resume, or if it's trying to get the more professional experience. Um, and I think what I really want everyone to pay attention to here is that, you need to adapt to the Canadian way of doing things and that the techniques that you use back home, wherever that home is, it could be anywhere from Europe to Latin America, to Africa, to the Middle East, to Southeast Asia, you need to transform to the way that Canada does things. And this is why we're here tonight, because Rory's going to provide you with some great skills for how to improve your resume, because he is quite right. There are a lot of terrible resumes that are out there. Um, improve it so that you start to get seen, because that resume is your ticket to get you into an interview where you're going to then be able to share the wealth of experience that you have. Go for it, Rory. Perfect. Thanks, Liz. And look, this quick. This is the question I ask a lot of people when they start complaining. This is hard. I start hearing blame factor. They're making excuses. And then I kind of go, look, you came all this way, but you actually want Canada to adapt to you instead of you adapting to Canada. So just take, the takeaway today is there's a lot of things. We're just going to focus on the resume component, but here adapting well will save you time, energy, and money. So there's three good reasons to actually pay attention to what's going on. And your resume, as Liz mentioned, is that first impression. So if that resume isn't right, then you're not really going to get any further in your job hunt. So um, moving on from that, uh, job hunting is a life skill. You know, we all start this and we realize, okay, we just think this is a process. It's not. It's a process that will stay with you for the rest of your life because the embracing failure, the persistence, the breakthroughs you make, the celebrating the little successes, all of those things will teach you how to overcome any other challenge or adversity. I know a lot of you have been through a lot more adversity in job search in Canada, but this could be the could be the toughest part of your life right now. It's all relative, right? It really depends on the person and the situations. Um, and moving to Canada, if you create a free account, you can actually download our Getting Started Guide. There's a section here on Canadianizing your resume. We'll focus a lot on that today. Researching the jobs market. Are, foreign, are my credentials recognized in Canada? What courses do I have to take? Do I have to register with a local body? Uh, we talk about your online presence as in, you know, being on LinkedIn, if that's appropriate, being having a clean presence on all the other social media. So just realizing that you have an online presence, people will Google your name and they'll Google uh, to, to learn more about you. We talk about networking. Uh, we talk about targeted applications. One of the things I see a lot is I, I meet a job hunter and they send me their resume and I ask them, where have you applied? And they list off 30 to 40 companies. And then I look at their resume and I'm just like, oh, no, 
You know, you've literally blown your chance because you've sent off 40 rushed applications. You saw the jobs online and you're just on a roll. Those are not targeted applications. There is That is just dumping your resume to the companies that you want to work with and paying very little attention to detail. So we'll focus a little bit more on that later if we have time. But I just want to say is targeted applications matter. It's about reading the requirements. It's like a game of bingo. You know what the numbers are. These are the job requirements. Make sure the numbers are on your resume. Um, it's very much common sense, but nobody seems to practice it. And uh, then we talk about improving the process. It's like iterating on each of these things. Your resume will constantly evolve. Your online presence will constantly evolve. You're always going to be networking. And guess what? All of these skills will benefit your career after you land your first job because suddenly you've built a friend network. You've built a professional network. You've developed a lot of new skills in Canada and you've developed the desire to succeed and actually create your own journey in Canada. So don't think of this as just a process that you overcome and it's just a case of sending out 50 quick ac applications and one of them will like you but just remember it's all about our process and continuously improving all great points all right so we're going to focus on one little component of this today it's going to be resume writing um, I'm just going to highlight in context here some of the other areas, right? Uh, your results-focused resume, the focus is selling yourself, right? It's not, this is who I am. You actually want to sell yourself. So you want to focus on the positives. I know a lot of people say, highlight the positives or hide, hide the weaknesses, highlight the positives. It's really a case of focus on what you're good at. You can't be great at everything, but give working examples of how you've delivered results in your job. It doesn't matter whether you work in hospitality, customer service, or uh, you're a heart surgeon. You know you have results and KPIs for every single job. How how is your how is your performance measured by your manager? That's how you should be communicating uh, in your resume. In, in order to sell yourself, we also talk about business cards or having an elevator pitch. I'm just acknowledging that these are components. We talked about researching the jobs market, SWOT analysis, in case anyone hasn't heard of it, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What are you good at? What are you weak at? What are the opportunities for you? And what are the threats? So it's really understanding what these things and essentially trying to find your weaknesses and see if you can address them. To give you a very solid example is your weakness is a, a specific software program in your field. You can go into your first interview having studied hours of free YouTube tutorials on said software product. Instead of saying, I've never worked with this, say, I haven't worked with this to date, but I'm actively learning or I've, I've enrolled in a course or I've, I've watched five hours of YouTube videos and these were my takeaways. So everybody wants to hire the enthusiastic person who's working to improve their weaknesses rather than saying, I haven't had a chance to work on this and just pausing. Um, the online presence, just to reiterate, we talked about LinkedIn, but we also talk about clearing social media. If you have strong views on anything, remove them from your public profile. Nobody wants to know if you're a Trump fan or if you're pro any cause or any controversial cause. It can impact your job search. So think about clearing your social media and adding to your LinkedIn. Um, networking, we talk about all the time, but I just kind of want to reiterate two things. Networking is actually building a team. Instead of it just being you and your job hunt, you're actually building a motivated team of people. You have to lead the team. How do you lead your team? You communicate with them. You highlight your objective. You keep them updated. Um, one, of the, one of the most significant tricks I've uh, passed on to people is sending a weekly update to your network. Your network could be one, peop uh, one person when you arrive. It could be five on week two. It could be 15 people by week four. But you're sending them an email update every week to tell them what positive things you have done this week to further your job search. It's not about getting negative emotions, saying I'm getting frustrated. I keep getting rejected. I'm thinking of leaving. I'm going to move. I'm going to, uh, I need to start off again. I'm going to move to another city. Stop the excuses and the frustration. Just focus on what positive things you have done and allow you to assess, am I actually moving forward or am I just waiting for things to happen? 
I just want to stop you for one second here, Rory, too, because you've made some really solid uh, points here. The first one is the results focused resume. I think this is one of the biggest things I see when I'm working with clients is that um, they give almost too much high level detail in terms of what their duties are in a job. And those duties, unfortunately, is what any candidate is going to do in that job. It's just general responsibilities, whether that's taking notes in a meeting or setting up meetings or dealing with internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, managing teams. What you really want to be able to demonstrate on your resume is how did you do this differently than all of the other people who are applying? What are some of the challenges that you faced? What are some of the successes that you had? And being able to demonstrate that on your resume, because that's what's going to make you stand out. You have to remember that recruiters, HR managers, they will see anywhere from 10 to hundreds of resumes. And if you've got the right information on there, you're going to be able to stand out. I think another really valid point that you made there, Rory, is the cleaning of social media. Um, you know, it's it's really important. These things are looked at, whether it's your Facebook account, your Instagram account, but most especially LinkedIn. And we talked about this last week in a in a platform or a discussion that we had. You need to make sure that LinkedIn presents you professionally and nothing else and that you are taking the time to connect with people and build that network. Most of you on this call would have had a network that you relied on at home and you don't have that here now. And so one of the first steps you should be taking is reaching out and not only reaching out to ask for work, reaching out to ask for help, ask for connections, ask for knowledge, ask for, could you please let me know how did you get to where you are? Those kinds of things that's going to strengthen your network. It's going to put you in people's minds and it's going to help you make that transition from a job seeker into somebody who's employed. Excellent. And like, just to give you an example, as in, I, I remember one of my first resumes, what I did was it's like, it's awkward. You grab a template, you look at your job description for your last job, you pull out the basic duties. As Liz said, that is performance neutral is uh, how I call it to my candidates that I'm dealing with. I'm saying, did you do a good job or did you do a bad job? You know, you're highlighting the duties of your job, but you're not even mentioning whether you did a good job. That's why we talk about results. It's all about performance. So how is success measured in your role? What's the difference between you and your colleague in terms of performance? If you if you are a high performer, how what are you doing differently? And focus on that. Focus on what differentiates you rather than what makes you the same. If you work in customer service, people know what a customer service reps do. They want to know what can you do. So put numbers on the problem or put metrics. How, what are your metrics? How is it measured? What is the relative performance of you and your peers? So giving any indication of performance is useful. Um, the last point, I touched on this already, but you know, cover letter, putting time into a cover letter. To me, a cover letter is useless unless it's specific to the company and the role. Um, so don't bother sending a generic cover letter. If you're just going to write your resume in long form paragraph format, forget it. You know, if you're going to research a company and say what inspires you to apply for that company or what excited you about that job, then write a cover letter, but otherwise don't bother. Introductions are most important thing. Instead of writing um, a cover letter, you should be writing an email to somebody. You get somebody's email or you get introduced by email and then you're actually it's a it's an email introduction instead of an actual generic cover letter so i really advise people if you're applying for jobs online you're not doing the right thing so online job searching is a waste of time so the next time you're thinking you're applying for a job online ask yourself is there a better way you know you mm -hmm. can look at the company on linkedin you can google them you can find somebody who works for that company ask your network your growing network do you know anybody who works at company X? Um, you can, you know, I think LinkedIn is the most useful there, but building your network or just asking asking your network. So applying, you once you apply online, that's it. Uh, how'd you move forward from there? You know, mm -hmm. you get a generic email, you often don't get feedback. Um, yes, if you do get introduced to somebody, you can say, hey, you can acknowledge I've made an online application, but wouldn't it be better put all of the front loading into getting introduced to somebody and then making that impression? Because what happens when you get introduced to somebody, you pass on the resume, it goes directly to the HR manager. It's not a HR admin who's reading 
200 yeah her job is to review 200 emails she's got two or 200 resumes she's got two hours to do it and she needs to get through the pile and suddenly you've got 20 seconds to impress so you don't have their attention you get their attention if you earn their attention so really focus on those principles trying not to apply for jobs online if possible it's a great point. Or even using LinkedIn to find out who the hiring manager is and putting that cover letter to someone's name instead of saying, dear hiring manager, something as simple as that could be a, a strong step forward to you. So what are the obstacles you need to overcome? Um, lack of Canadian experience. I could talk about this for 90 minutes and think I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it very uh, vaguely. Okay. For some reason or another, Canadians are obsessed with people doing things their way for better or worse um the point i always make is that it's it's actually a principle against innovation it's like protectionism right it's trying to protect canadians uh, into canadian jobs and yet we have surplus newcomers but we have a, a labor shortage in the province um i won't say any more about it except to say it's really silly but it's it's a real life obstacle we need to overcome how do you overcome it you you speak up to the learning curve. You ask questions around the learning curve. What challenges have similar candidates uh, coming from abroad had in this role? What can I do today to improve my um, uh, earn to improve my candidacy for this role? What can I do to learn before starting in a position like this? Who else should I speak with to learn more about this? So that's four questions you can ask to overcome this challenge. It's just knowing bring bring it up don't be afraid not to bring it up if you bring it up you're controlling the narrative on the story right that's a great point I think also acknowledging the knowledge gap though Rory I think and that's something you had on your last slide is that there's going to be a knowledge gap it wouldn't matter if I transition to another job I would have a knowledge gap I'm born and raised Canadian um, all of you are going to have something that you need to either upgrade or something to kind of get aligned with what's happening in Canada but by addressing it and and showing the employer that you're in the process of acknowledging that or completing that knowledge gap, it's going to put you ahead. Perfect. So immigration risk, okay? Yes, you've immigrated here. You've gone through a lot of effort, but if you're on a temporary work permit or permanent residency or any other status, there's still a risk that you won't settle here. There's a risk that your family won't settle. There's, um, so that's the biggest challenge um, Canadian employers have is, and believe me, I've been rec uh, recruiting international workers for 10 years. Some of them ask, how long is your candidate going to be around for? And you know, respectfully, I go, well, how long is your local candidate going to be around for? You know, you can't control any of these things, but the idea is if here's the other thing, control the narrative, just like the first one, tell people from the very start of the interview, I'm immigrating from country X. I've moved here with my family. I've moved here alone. I've moved here with my partner. My intention is to relocate permanently in Canada. Why I'm interested in being here and what your plan is to get from temporary to permanent status. So don't be afraid of this. Don't wait till the end of the interview to get asked questions about lack of Canadian experience or immigration risk. You've lost the game if you're waiting for the hiring manager to bring those up. You know it's undermined, so attack those things in the first five, ten minutes of the interview if you can. Mm -hmm. When I say attack, I mean deal with them. So, <laughs> but just just so to be clear though, too, this is a challenge that people with their PR also face. This it, it's yes. not necessarily that you're on a work visa or on a study visa. There is that idea that you know, unfortunately, a lot of employers are concerned about working with newcomers because they are in fear of being that transition job that's going to lead them to the employment that they're really looking for. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, and again, reassure your employer that, you know, I'm here. This is what I want to do. I want to work with you and and ask them, you know, how can I grow within your organization? Demonstrate that you are there, that you want to be able to work with them. And but you also want to develop as an employee and not just stay in an entry level position. Yeah, and exactly. I think even you touched on that risk as well, that risk that you'll move on to a better job. But like I would say is aim aim for your dream. Spend enough time aiming for your dream job from the start, okay? If you set out your stall and you set about uh, uh, aiming for your dream job from the very start, then and only then can you lower your standards when you're not getting feedback. So I'll talk a little bit more about survival 
jobs and things like that, I don't recommend that people go from the start saying, hey, I'm just going to get an admin job just to get Canadian experience. Set out set out for your exact role and just be realistic with yourself, knowing the gaps. You have to have an honest assessment, but set out for your dream role from the very start and then work your way down uh, slowly over time. But be prepared to fund that job search. You know, as in, I always ask people the question is, would you prefer to wait three months and find your dream job instead of panicking after a month and taking a survival job and then feeling obligation to that employer that you need to stay six months? You're not helping anyone. You just haven't planned for success in Canada. So plan that it can take anywhere from one to two to sometimes three months to, to find a job, depending on how ambitious you are and how realistic you are. So at, at a certain point, you should be able to accept that maybe this job isn't realistic for me. But if you're getting interviews and you're missing out, as in, for example, one of uh, my recent hires from India, as in he found he was, he was a, for a marketing role, he was going to the final level with a lot of companies, but he felt his lack of local experience was holding him back. And my approach was marketing is marketing. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. So you will find an employer that resonates and doesn't say, but he hasn't worked in Canada. You will find an immigrant who knows the score and understands how silly this Canadian experience thing is because immigrants rise up other immigrants as well and just use your network. Um, whatever country you're from, use that network to your advantage. Don't be afraid to ask people advice, ask them for an informational interview and say, what changes did you make to yourself when you arrived in Canada and study that list very, very carefully? Um, we talk about cultural risk here. Um, a lot of people have language barriers and accent communication style, right? As in, I laugh, I'm Irish. We didn't have, I didn't have serious cultural barriers, but my accent was one. I had to learn how to slow down and enunciate. We speak very quickly. Um, I was working over the phone for my first three or four years in Canada, and I used to have to constantly repeat myself. So eventually I learned, OK, I have to slow down. If you can learn that lesson very quickly and just slow down when you're chatting in an interview, you're going to overcome language barriers or an accent or communication um, barriers. Right. Um, you know, simple things like making sure you understand the question, you know, as in a lot of people, especially if they're English as a second language. They feel this uh, burning desire to answer the question full go and say, sorry, I don't understand the question or get used to rephrasing the question back at an interviewer. Because when you answer the question wrong, you fail the interview because you should know better than to answer a question if you don't know what the question is. You know, you're guessing what the question is and you're answering a different different questions so that's something that I take very seriously myself because you got to know the limitations of your knowledge and if you don't know what was said you need to ask the question such a great point this is I cannot stress that enough especially in an interview situation there is nothing wrong even as a English native speaker I will say either repeat the question back to them to make sure that I fully understand it especially if there's two questions in one and there's nothing wrong just saying, could you please repeat it to me? Could you say it in a different way? Employers are more than willing to do this. The, the rate of Canada right now, you know, our population is a huge number of immigrants. Canadian employers are getting accustomed to this. So just do not talk yourself out of a job because you're going to demonstrate that you don't know how to answer a question. Yeah, we're we're the solution to the labor shortage in Canada, but we got to exactly. do the things to help us get through. And that means, you know, that would that that's a very silly error to make in a, in an interview and it happens and i find it hard to forgive because i'm like you're you're essentially bluffing you know you're you're trying to impress somebody but you're actually bluffing and yes you can make a mistake but when it happens two or three times in an interview it's very hard to forgive because you need to realize everyone will be patient and understanding if you have a language barrier but they need to make sure that you understand communication and communication is about understanding what was said and using your skills to make sure you answer the right question. Yeah. Um, just you know, some high level things in your resume. I talked about it earlier. You literally have 20 to 30 seconds to make an impression. I, I don't spend longer on and, and that when I review a resume. If it's very hard to read, if it's uh, messy, 
I'm just struggling. I'm really struggling. There has to be some eye-catching content in it. So we'll focus on how to catch people's attention in the first 20 seconds in a moment. But I just want you to really get into the mindset that somebody is typically going to spend 20 to 30 seconds looking at this document. So you, it's it's on you to make sure that it's easy to read, easy to understand. And uh, there's potential tricks as well to making that 20 seconds good. Um, something a lot of people don't represent is it uh, or um, understand is it doesn't matter how um, how highly educated or how highly experienced you this is your golden ticket in Canada this represents you in the jobs market yeah you you can't a lot of people just say hey it's fine I can talk about what I've done in my role when I get to the interview you're not going to get to the interview if your resume doesn't sell your skills so the focus of this document is to win an interview. Do not assume that a company is going to want to interview me because of my education, my previous employer, or my wealth of international experience. It's on you to adapt that experience and make a really strong impression for them initially. Um, I talk about ensuring it's perfect, continuous improvement, right? As in, don't let, um, you know, Perfection, we always strive for perfection, but always know that perfect today might not be perfect next week. You know, keep revising it, keep uh, keep having uh, the challenge with resumes is everyone has different opinions. Sometimes opinions conflict each other. Um, Liz might say one thing, I might say the other, and we might we might disagree completely on it. But sometimes you just have to use your judgment um, on things and rationalize it. Right. But it's a case sometimes of maybe double checking with a third party. If you got conflicting advice from two people, right. Um, really focus on what differentiates you from others, right. Uh, Liz mentioned that earlier when we talked about results is in your results differentiate you. They're not shared by anyone else that should make your resume a lot more, um, a lot more readable. You know, the fact that uh, you're what what else differentiates you from others, your personality, your hard skills, your soft skills, your attitude to problem solving. So really focus on asking yourself after every line in your resume is, does this differentiate me? You know, or so what is the easy thing I think of? Ask yourself, so what at the end? What am I trying to communicate in this? Am I just putting in a line because I think it's important and it sounds good? Or does it actually differentiate me from other candidates for this position? Or does it differentiate me from my colleagues in my past position? Mm -hmm. Um. A, like what we focus on here, the strong results fo focused resume. So your personality, your personality has got to come true. Otherwise, you're just a robot. We have uh, generative AI, guys. Generative AI can do everything. It, can, it doesn't have a personality. So figure out, ask your colleagues, ask your former boss, ask your friends, what, what personality traits, um, uh, what personality traits do you admire in me most? And figuring out as in, because if you describe yourself on the start of your resume and you resonate to those things as you go through an interview, that shows that you're very self-aware and it, it gives people that warm feeling that this person is representing themselves accurately. This person understands their strengths and understands their weaknesses and is presenting themselves very accurately. You've got to focus, what are your skill sets? What are your strengths? You know, you don't need to highlight your weaknesses on your resume. You just have to be aware of them and ideally have a plan for improving them. Your career objectives. What job are you titling? Sometimes I see resumes. They have an international um, job title and it doesn't mean anything to a Canadian employer. You're not actually saying, how, how can I help you? Tell the hiring manager how he can help you. So it's on you to figure out what the most suitable role for you in Canada and what a realistic career path to achieving that role is you know if you're a project manager and you only have say six months of experience guess what you're probably going to have to start in a lower level uh, role in Canada and then go back up to that so if you call yourself a project manager you're probably not going to overcome the lack of local experience the immigration risk um, all of those things because if you kind of say I'm a capable project manager, but willing to step into an assistant project manager role 
uh, with a view to taking on a project manager position in one to two years, that sounds like somebody who's got a plan for their career, right? So always think about what's your objective, your initial objective and where you want to be long term. I love asking people, what, where do you want to be in three years? It would be great if, you're, uh, if your professional summary focused on that. What do I want to be doing in two to three years time in Canada once, once I do a job for this employer in a lower role? Where am I going to add the most value in the medium term for an employer? You've made um, that again, Rory, sorry to cut you off. You made a lot of great points there. A couple of things that I just really want to focus on um, and being mindful of time as well. Um, there are some things that your resume demonstrates. So oftentimes people, I will see people say, I'm an excellent communicator. I have excellent attention to detail, uh, things like that. You know, I've got strong writing skills. And then I see a resume that's got no formatting, it's got spelling errors, it's got grammatical errors, things like that. And that immediately demonstrates to me that you're not telling me the truth. Because if you had these qualities, then you would have triple checked this document to ensure that these errors aren't on there. So this is something that I highly encourage, especially in the world that we live in now, where we have so many things that can check your grammar, check your spelling, and figuring out what template or what format is going to work with you that makes your resume visually eye appealing. This is your resume is as important as you showing up to your interview in professional clothing and shine shoes. It is the very first impression that you make to an employer. And if it is not done well, you're not going anywhere. Um, the other thing that I think is really important that you mentioned is your personality is showing your personality through that. I mean, it is a bit robotic and I know that you want to try to get your job. I mean, you don't want to come across as a cheerleader in your resume, but at the same time, you do want to demonstrate that you're not a robot, that you do have skills, you do have personality and you do have the ability to do the job in a way that's different than the other applicants. And the, again, the end result is just to get you into that interview. So you don't have to share your entire life story on your resume. You need to share the key components of your experience that are going to intrigue somebody enough to pick up the phone, to call you, to learn more about the work that you've done. So you don't need to make it five or six pages. If you have four solid accomplishment statements where you can demonstrate that you were able to solve a problem or that you were able to help the business improve their process or motivate a team to drive results, that's going to be sufficient enough to make somebody want to call you. These are just things to consider when writing your resume. Perfect. And while I think of it, I haven't mentioned is what lint your resume should be, but I'm really fed up with people providing a one page resume. There is no valid reason to provide a one page resume in Canada, guys. It's it's a bit of an urban myth. Um, take as much space as you want to provide relative information, but it, sh it really shouldn't be more than two pages if you've less than five years experience. And it shouldn't be less than four if you've got three or four or like, you know, 10, 15 years of experience. So I, my rule is no more than four pages, but two, three, four pages is okay, depending on the breadth of experience or if there's lots of projects. So as long as it's relevant content, I've never ever had a resume rejected by a client for its lint. So I really want you to take away that because a lot of people focus on the one page and you don't, it's so hard to convey anything on one page. So you're essentially sabotaging yourself based on an urban myth that a, a resume needs to be one page. But relevant, relevant information is the key word there. Don't tell your life story. Make sure that it matches to the job that you're applying for. Perfect. Um, all right. I think we're tracking okay for time. Yeah, this, we're, right uh, time. we're doing, yeah, we're doing pretty decent. So components of your resume. Okay. We talked about the first 20 seconds. Professional summary. Just think of like the back of a book, okay? If you're going to read a book or watch a movie, what you do, you flick the trailer on, you want a quick review of what am I going to invest my time in watching or reading? So your professional summary is an actual broad summary of your resume, your skills, your personality. We'll focus on it a little bit deeper, but that's your 20 seconds to impress. You should be able to send that, that paragraph to an employer and say, that covers it. So we talk about having 20 seconds, get nail that professional summary, and then you're, you're on the right path. They're only going to read more if you've engaged them on that professional summary. Um, whoops, work experience, that's a little bit obvious. We'll focus on how it looks. 
educational and professional ad- uh, development. Obviously, we're going to mention education, but professional development is something people leave out courses. What are you doing to improve? Everyone loves the continuous learner. You've got a lot of adapting to do in Canada, so it wouldn't be great if you're continuously taking courses. Uh, Udemy has free courses in any topic. There's lynda.com. It's free, so you can take courses in anything to help you overcome that learning curve in Canada and show that you have a passion for adapting, right? So the power of professional development, it doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. And then asking what other professional development should I be doing to help myself in this role in Canada? Software and skills, hobbies and interests. I used to tell people not to bother, but I actually do like it now because I, it tells me a lot about the person I'm interacting with by their hobbies and interests, right? I can actually profile a person by... I'm reading their I'm reading their resume and then I kind of go, oh, okay, I thought you'd been to these hobbies. So it also gives a talking point for hiring managers. So it's nice to see what people do. One of the things I always ask people is what's your passion? You know, what do you do when you're not working? Because I want to know what the person is like, what motivates them, what what they live for, because you can't motivate somebody unless you know what motivates them, right? Um now we're just gonna go flick to a template. So the one apology I have here is that we're going to focus on, oh, sorry, night mode is kicked in on my computer because it's dark. Is it okay? People can read this okay? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So it's it's white on black instead of black on white. So it's just because it's gotten dark outside. So um, I'm going to talk you through just, this is a template. I'm not mandating that anyone uses this, but I recommend the reason why is it conserves space. It's a great checklist on what you should be including. And it's like, for example, is a lot of people send me resumes with their date of birth, their marital status, a beautiful image up top, or they spend the top half a page is all of their contact information and all of their things. Be, you've got to use space well, right? This is a two page template, one header for all of your contact information, your name up top, your basic information. This is where you're job hunting from. I would prefer to be true with employers. If you are not yet in Canada, I think it's best to tell people that. Um, I know you can get a Canadian number, but I find those tactics are a little bit deceptive. If you're not in the country yet, it's better to level up with people. Um, The target job title, it seems so obvious, but so many people fail to do this. They write professional summary. Professional summary is a heading. I want you to put the target job title that best suits your career in Canada here. This requires a lot of research. Um, if you call yourself uh, a site, uh, for example, a site engineer, um, for example, is you should know what the terminology in Canada is, right? Um, this was initially a construction focused workshop, but I accept that there's a lot of people who are not in construction. So we're kind of going to focus on a little bit more generics here than uh, the specifics, but um, Liz is going to share a, res- a, gen- a general resume template, which is this one, and a construction specific one, which kind of relates to projects. And she's going to share those with each of you after this um, after this session. So we talk about the professional summary, right? What I've done here is your personality, your strengths, the roles you've held. So this is like a career summary, right? You might mention started my career in job title X then progress quickly with the same company over five years, taking on um, t- job title Y. And that kind of shows your transition. People are now understanding, okay, you started in this role, you're promoted or else you're headhunted and offered this role. And it's just showing your career trajectory, right? That's very, very useful to convey if you've got 20 seconds to impress. Your education, you should make sure that's there. Um, you can just a simple thing. You can say, I hold a diploma in social science or I hold a master's in financial services. I think that's very relevant if you're going to give a summary of who you are to a future employer. Um, the overview of experience. This is very kind of construction specific, but you can relate this to any type of employer. Are you working with an agency? Are you working with a nonprofit? Are you working with a private corporation? Are you working with a public corporation? It matters. It's up to you to communicate them. I'll show you how to communicate it in your work experience, but you should have a grasp of where your previous employment fits into the the larger macro environment here. 
Um, the types of projects and values work. This is kind of relevant again for the construction example. And we talked about career things. It might sound like a lot to take in all of those things, but here's a go at doing it, right? This is a little bit wordy, but it's still eight lines. Um, I bet you could read this in 20 seconds and have a good grasp of that person, right? That's that's the goal, right? And at the end of the day, if you're going to make claims here, you're talking about your education, you're talking about how many years of experience, the roles that you've held, the types of projects that you've held, its infrastructure, some of your softer skills, and then you're actually talking about your career objectives. So you can use this as a template or build on it yourself, but this is kind of like a, a checklist for what you should be touching on it if you want to make it uh, an impression in 20 seconds with any employer. And Rory, would you recommend tailoring this part to individual job postings? Um, you could, of course. Um, obviously, if there's a if if you're targeting a specific job posting, I would have that exact title up there, right? It's just a very Absolutely. simple subliminal thing. Or else yeah. you could talk about what your objectives is, and you could say, you know, you could maybe acknowledge that you're uh, you're working towards that role, or you have this thing, and yeah, you could definitely tailor it if there's anything relative, right? If you're mm -hmm. looking for a job in a nonprofit, you'd want to make sure that you had nonprofit experience mentioned up here because mm -hmm. that person may or may not be looking for that type of skill set. So think of it just like a game of bingo. You know what the numbers are. They have written down what they're looking for in a candidate. You want to show them that you understand and you, uh, you are um, uh, their, their ideal candidate, right? Okay. Um, work experience or professional experience. This is, some of this seems pretty obvious to me, but I'm a big believer same line okay why did we put this on the same line because it's very efficient on space if you um I'll, I'll zoom out on this resume towards the end and we'll see how efficient it is on spaces and it should be easy to read things are jumping out at you sometimes people kind of change these things up i prefer having timelines to the far right it means somebody can scan the times very quickly just seeing the times out on the very side, you can see the career trajectory. I'm like, okay, two years here, two years there, four years there, okay? I'd probably be worried if it was two years, two years, two years, because guess what? There might be a pattern. But now this person has knuckled down and they've spent four years in the last job. So I'm a bit more excited as a job hunter. So I'm a big believer in just having your job location should always be there. Um, one thing I hate seeing is newcomers being deceptive about their international experience. And what I mean deceptive is they don't mention where it is. That's not advisable. That irritates me as a hiring manager. What you're trying to do is you're trying to pretend like it doesn't matter. Um, I see an international name of a company and I'm like, okay, well, why aren't you telling me where it is? Could you please tell me what country you worked in? You know, what mm -hmm. city and uh, what location you worked in? Um, something that's very important is a brief outline. All of you have worked internationally. Guess what? Your future hiring manager doesn't know your, your previous employer. So they would like a little bit of an outline. One line is sufficient, highlighting the services offered, the revenues or the type of projects. Sometimes you don't have the revenues. That's okay. But if you don't have revenues, tell me the staff count. What they really want to know is, are you working for a tiny nonprofit? or are you working for a large public corporation so all of these things here's an example of just how to how to communicate and you say here's a it's a it's a software company and here's the size so the employer gets an idea of the scale and the, the services offered by your previous employer if you leave this out um you're kind of failing you're expecting them to google the company you know, mm -hmm. I, I just want to add to this. Sorry to cut you off, Rory, that I have started implementing this with my clients and I am seeing a noted difference in the uptake on their resumes. And Judy ha, or Juby, sorry, has just asked a question saying, is the link of the company fine? I would say, no, you're making the employer work for you. you they're not going to do your job for you. Just provide the information for them. And depending on where you're from, certain countries, we're not able to access this information. I've tried to pull up multiple country or companies from certain places like Iran, for example, and I can't find that information. The employer is not going to do that step. They are not going to Google your company to find out where you worked. You need to provide this for them. 
and as much information as you can provide. Immediately, they get to see the size of the organization, the revenue of the organization. And for those of you in construction or engineering, immediately they get to see, you know, is it design build? Is it commercial? Is it residential? Is it industrial? Immediately they get to see that and they can immediately visualize how you're going to fit into their organization. So this is one small step to absolutely level up your resume. Perfect. I'm glad it's working. So um, yeah, it's critical to me to understand that. And yeah, the, the link is not okay. It's up to you to provide a one line description of your employer. The reason I say one line is three or four lines saying my company has won awards. It has done this. It operates in five different regions. That's not relevant. I'm not buying your company. I'm trying to, to make a decision on hiring you. So you're wasting a lot of space. So it's a lesson in brevity. Try to describe your company in one line, uh, highlighting the type of services, the revenues, the type of projects, or any any things that would help an employer understand uh, what uh, your previous employer. When we talk about the work experience, it's quite vague here, but I generally tell people three or four good bullet points. What do we mean by that? As in, do not just list the basic duties of your job description. Um, a good rule of thumb for people is I always ask, what are the two to three things that you're most proud of in your in your previous role? Start with those. Um, people's eyes will gravitate. They'll look at your previous role and they'll look at what are you most proud of in your previous role? Start with them. Quantify, quantify the outcome or quantify the results. Make sure you're relating to performance. Then you can mention mention some of the basic duties if you want. You know, sometimes it adds a little bit of context to the work. Um, I'm very focused on you know problems or situations encountered. So there is a formula here, as in it's on moving to Canada, it's on outposts. I'll I'll deal with it now and I'll reiterate later. So you always talk about what was the situation or problem, okay? So every action is as a result of something. So highlight the problem or the situation. So bring the, bring the hiring manager into the situation. Then you highlight the action taken. The action taken here is, this is about you. This is about you being the problem solver or the star of the show. And then you talk about the results achieved. So if you can think of that formula, you can change, you can start with the result then you can talk about the problem, then you can talk about the action, or you can change around the order of these to kind of move things around. But this is a very good way to focus more on performance because you're giving people, you're saying, this is the context of the, of the problem. This is what I did that other people wouldn't, or this is what skills I used, or this is how I use my personality to solve the problem. And then you talk about this outcome was good because, or you're trying to quantify the actual outcome. And again, we, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry to cut you off again. I keep cutting you off. Um, One thing I want to point out is this is another excellent way. So we talked about attention to detail when we look at formatting or spelling mistakes. You want to show me that you are a team player. If you want to show me that you are a problem solver, all of these soft skills that people just casually throw onto their resume, this is how you do it. You demonstrate it through a strong accomplishment statement. Show me what the problem was and how you were able to resolve it. Show me the size of the team that you worked on, what the problem was, how you were able to resolve it. This kind of thing, it will really help you to stand out to the employer and again, make them want to pick up that phone to call you. Perfect. Um, I have a little note here. Again, I can share the construction project based thing, but most people's work is either um, it's either a corporate role where you're dealing with kind of company objectives or else you're dealing with project objectives. Right. So it's fine if you don't have projects in your role. Most of the things you're doing are more corporate objectives. But if your work is project based highlight the key projects you worked on. You don't have to mention every project this person worked on in the last four years. Think of if I worked on 15 projects, maybe pick three or four of the ones that I'm most proud of. Some of them might have been repetitive. Um, some Sometimes we think every project matters because it's important and we need to put it in the kitchen sink and miss something. What you probably end up with is a very dull and boring resume that becomes repetitive. So think of the... Think of the problems that you're most proud of solving and think of the projects that you're most proud of working on. And that's always a good start, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. Another rule of thumb as well is depending on how long you're in the role might dictate how much of your, uh, how much space it uses on your resume, right? So if this person was in the last role for four years, they could probably go a little bit deeper. They could use maybe half a page on that, you know? So it's all about the context and uh, relevant information. Um, If you've been employed for 25 years, your resume should focus on the last five or six years. Forget about what you did in for years one to 10, because guess what? It was 15 years ago that you did this. Uh, You've probably doubled down on those skills a lot more and gained increasing responsibility. So um, that's another excuse people make for a long resume. They say, sorry, I have 12 years of experience. It's impossible to characterize it all. And then I turn around to them and I say, would I be correct if I, if, if I assumed that the last three or four years of your career was a much stronger trajectory than the previous eight? So not every work experience is important. That's what I want you to take away here is in uh, there's a recency bias because that's the role you've been working in. In the most recent that generally tells people that's where you're best served and that's where you're most interested on unless you're trying to change your career and then that's a different conversation which you probably need to communicate up top right can i ask you a question about that rory like so for instance someone's got 25 years of experience would you expect to see that first job as long as it was relevant to employment, at least on the resume so that they could kind of stand and show that they've got the 25 years of experience, not necessarily that they need to have five accomplishment statements, just maybe one short one that kind of illustrates where they started and then work themselves back to their most recent role? Yeah, what I generally do is, and I'd, I'd still recommend them, it's 25 years of experience, but I'd say, look, let's try and get this to three pages. The four pages okay. is A-OK, but I would be OK with seeing the, you know, basically seeing the, the top header and one bullet point saying, um, you know, graduate position as a graduate position as a... Uh, um, as I'm trying not to get construction focused, as an administrator doing tasks A, B, and C. It's kind of more related to duties. And you know what? When you start off in a junior role, it's very important to speak to performance. And I understand that's the biggest challenge that graduates have. They don't know. I don't know the context of my role, but ask your boss about Mm -hmm. the context of your role. Uh, What would happen if you didn't perform your job well? Most people should know that, right? If I make mistakes, what happens? What's the business impact of me performing my role? And whether you're in men or um, whether you're in hospitality, that impact should be very, very clear. So if you're not clear on it, ask your previous employer, ask your colleagues, what's the impact of me doing my job well? And how does it help my company achieve their business goals? Because now you're getting to performance and you're actually, you know, you're communicating. Hiring managers think about high level problems. If you're dealing with low level tasks and talking about your ability to do low, low level activities and not mentioning performance, you're not engaging a hiring manager. Hmm. That's a great point. Um, beyond that, that's kind of the theme. I'll focus more on the do's and don'ts as we get back to the slide. Here in education and development, you know, it's just very simple. I would always say you start with the, you know, whether it's a degree or a diploma or a master's, the university. GPA is important. Most countries don't use GPA. They have um, a, a different system. It's on you to understand that employers want to know what your GPA is. So convert it. You can convert it. Every score is between one and four. Four is 100% in everything. Three is 75% in every exam. So convert um, your accreditation to a similar GPA status. Everyone either has a percentage or in Europe, they have an honors kind of first class, second class honor system. So figure out what the GPA equivalent of your role is. Always have the timelines there. Sometimes if you're a graduate, I always encourage them. Sometimes all you have is your education. You've no work experience. So get into detail on the modules, get into detail on the projects. If you studied a degree 25 years ago, one line is okay. You can just mention a degree. Your projects probably don't matter. So this is all kind of optional thing. But sometimes if you have only two or three years of experience, you're leaning heavily on your education and those Mm -hmm. two or three years of experience. But please tell me that you can fill two pages with content, right? Regardless, right? A graduate, it might be very difficult to, but if you've got three or four years of experience, you have to be able to fill two pages of content, you know? 
figure out ideas on how can I share more about the context that I was working, the performances, the problems I solved. So mm -hmm. these are all questions to kind of motivate people and nobody can solve this problem for you because you were the person in the job. You can chat with your former employer or your former colleagues to get more context or a higher level kind of meaning from this. But, but um, education, I generally use terms like high school. High school is not used in Europe, but I want you to use those terminologies. If you're talking about um, what so where you went to school as a teenager, use the Canadian terminologies. We mentioned courses here, courses if they're relevant because they just communicate your learning. Um, I've put in some other notes, you know, if it's relevant to the job posting, mention it, anything relevant, if it helps showcase software skills, hobbies and interests, you know, here are examples. So um, Liz, unless you have any other comments, I'm going to go back to the slides and then just kind of go through some more of the kind of do's and the don'ts. Absolutely. The only comment I want to make, and you can transfer back to the slides, is that one thing that I have found about working with clients on this kind of template and really making them work through the idea of their projects or providing information to their companies or really thinking about their achievements and challenges, that you're already doing interview preparation for yourself. So in fact, you're killing two birds with one stone, as we say because you're already starting to think about how you're going to be able to demonstrate these skills to your employers. So though it does seem like a lot of work at the beginning and you know, working on a good resume, it takes time. It's not something that you can just kind of pull out in an hour. Trust me, I work on resumes all day long. It's a lot of work, but if you put that time and effort in, you are setting yourself up not only to have an interview, but also have a good interview where you're able to go into further detail about the evidence that you've put on your resume to show them why you're a good fit for the role. So it is really worth the time. That's a fantastic comment. And that's one of the things I take great pride in as a recruiter, because I tell people that the interview prep is easy once you've done the hard work on your resume. Most job hunters, all they want to do is send out their resume. But if you take an extra three or four days, I always tell people it's the best paid part time job you will ever have, you know, taking three, four, five, even 10 hours onto your resume. It can add five to ten thousand dollars onto your job search, you know, depending on the seniority of your role. I'm just making a kind of more thing, but like how the value it can add to your career is exponential. So think of doing the hard work up front and then doing it right because um, preparing for an interview is really easy if you know all the problems you solved in your role and you know the business results you achieved and you know the feedback that you got from managers. So doing all of this hard work up front is basically front loading your job search. Um, I know we have about five minutes left and we've quite a few slides. So I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. There's a lot sure. of valuable stuff here, but we'll, I'll share the slides with people as well. Perfect. Um, one of the critical things in job hunting is just your psychology and your mindset. A lot of people get very, very panicky uh, newcomers. You know, they come to me and they say, look, I'm giving up and all the negativity in the language. Nobody wants to help a whiny, moany newcomer. OK, and that applies to everyone, whether you're paid to help them or not. You've got to be positive. You've got to learn from your mistakes. Take on the feedback, you know, as in the biggest challenge I have. And I don't know if I made the point is the more educated you are, your tip, the more stubborn you are. That's sometimes our biggest weakness in terms of adapting. I see that over and over again. It's the people with the masters and the PhDs and the degrees. You tell them and you say, this resume isn't good enough and they get offended. I'm like, this resume isn't good enough is a statement. It's somebody who's knowledgeable telling you that you need to improve your document. So take emotion and take ego out of the equation and actually have to have a, a mindset that wants to improve. So remove your ego and you'll actually improve and listen, listen to people rather than reacting. Um, most smart employers will hire for attitude and train for skills. That's why I talk about professional development, knowing what your weakness is, having informational interviews, telling a future employer, I've actually met two or three other immigrants who are working in my field for the last few years and I got their advice. I took action on it and I've started taking courses on Udemy or YouTube or Lynda for free 
to uh, to round my skills. That's the story you want to be telling a, hire, a future hiring manager. Um, the power of tact and persistence. Um, most people, most busy people, it's not one email isn't enough. Uh, when I started off my business as a newcomer, no experience, it takes four, five, six efforts to get hold of a busy person and get their help. Do not give up. Just be conscious that you can use tact and persistence to achieve your goal without annoying them. The other point is relating to the impossible task. Sometimes jumping for a job above your skill set. The perception with the impossible task is it's impossible, so nobody tries. So don't be afraid to reach for the stars. And if you think somebody isn't, if you think somebody's never going to connect with you in LinkedIn, you're right. But try, you know, send them a well-researched, um, send them a well-researched note on why you think um, you'd like to connect with them or why you'd love to meet them for a coffee or why you'd love to buy them lunch, which I'm going to recommend later. Um, but just do it and try it again and follow up again and just come up with a clever way to remind, your, uh, remind yourself rather than saying is you didn't respond to my email. That's the truth, but you want their help. So be tactful in how you approach these things. Mm -hmm. um, pace yourself. It's a roller coaster. You know, I talk about six to eight weeks. It can be longer depending on how much ambition you have. It can be much, much longer. So prepare for a roller coaster of emotions. You're going to start hating Canada. You're going to start hating the system. You're going to start hating employers. You're going to start hating HR people. Be cognizant of what you're doing. You know, you're blaming other people. You're in control here and there's positive things you can do every day if you show up and you have a dashboard to remind you. What I mean by a dashboard is have a spreadsheet, employer, the company name, the contact at the company the job description, your strengths and weaknesses for that, and work on that dashboard every day, whether it's a written dashboard, whether it's in Word or whether it's in spreadsheet. Know what you need to do every day. Job hunting is a 40 hours a week task. If you're putting five hours a week into it, you'll get back, uh, you'll get back short results. If you make it a full-time job, you'll, make, uh, you'll get results fast. Um, all I'll say is don't set milestones. Everyone runs around like a headless chicken until they have the job or they don't have the job. You're immediately, a, a, you're not a success until you have the job. Set intermediate milestones. Say, I'm going to set a goal to achieve three informational interviews so I understand my role. I'm going to find three or four people to refer me to the companies, my dream employers, and I'm going to measure myself on interviews and not, not just a job offer. Uh, recruiters, um, people should know how they work, but people should know how they don't work as well. I find that there's an amazing over-reliance on recruiters. Recruiters can sell you if you can sell yourself. It's not their job to improve your resume. We spend a lot of time doing it for our candidates, but the typical recruiter, they will grab your resume as is. And if it's not sellable to their client, they're not interested. So understand how they can benefit you and how the limitation. I would only work with referrals and recruiters. If you go to the big agencies and you apply online, guess what? You're dealing with the newest recruiter who's just trying to earn their thing and doesn't have a lot of knowledge. So it can be very dangerous to lean on, the, uh, lean on recruiters. Um, and then understand that it's a recruitment fee, right? I recruit newcomers all the time, but I do such a good job in helping them with their resume. I only work with candidates who are up for the job, work on their resume. I've perfectly communicated their experience. I've helped them prepare. Then an employer is willing to pay a fee for that. But if you have a shoddy resume, no, no recruiter is going or no employer is going to pay a recruitment agency a fee for your candidacy because you're not selling yourself, right? It really comes down to, it's up to you to build a foundation and then disguise the limit from there. Paying someone to write your resume, I'm very against that because it's your resume, it's your personality, it's your experience. Um, from the start, I'm all about empowering people. I'm helping you identify the questions to ask. Yes, pay somebody to review you your resume, but just understand the weaknesses that somebody has. People spend a lot of money and don't get to a good place on the service.
Um, mm. I've told a lot of people that you've wasted $200, you've wasted $300. Um, there's a lot of resume, self-proclaimed resume experts out there. Um, and then the problem is they may have worked in one field and they don't understand every other field. So try and avoid spending a lot of time and realize it, the work is up to you. Uh, survival jobs, um, this is deemed as something that's below your level of employment, but it's critical if you want to survive through two, three, four months of job hunting in Canada. What I recommend people do is do all of the research before you arrive. Have your resume ready before you arrive. If you're not at that point right now, focus on that right now and get that ready. Once you get your resume right, you do all of your research, you figure out your strengths and weaknesses, you you know the companies, you've identified an employer and you started sending out things, then you can take on a survival job to keep yourself busy during the day. Um, sometimes 40 hours a week for more than two or three weeks is too much. And then you need to kind of focus on other things, right? So you've got to know when the point is when I need to get outside and just I'm going stir crazy. I'm looking at this project too much or it's a bit of a waiting game right now. When you're confident, you've put the right resume into the right employers. That's the time to get busy keeping your wait, playing the waiting game. The HR process is painfully slow in Canada. Most mm -hmm. Solid candidates get the offer of their dreams a month after starting a, a, an average job, you know, um, so be conscious of that. Be willing to wait three months if it means getting a job that's within your ability. And how do you figure out it's within your ability? An informational interview should tell you. That person should tell you is, am I being too aggressive chasing a director role in Canada? Am I being too aggressive chasing a project manager role in Canada? That's the power of an informational interview. It's somebody in the local market. Um, networking, don't ask people to buy them coffee, please. Coffee is such a commodity right now. If you want somebody's help and you think they can help you, make an investment, buy them lunch. I understand that newcomers are on a tight budget, but you gotta understand that coffee is everywhere right now. Try and everyone's got to eat even the busiest person if you can say is i understand you're incredibly busy could i buy you lunch downstairs in your building someday you'll be amazed what uh how powerful that can be that's great advice um rory okay is this the last one i just want to be conscientious we got about 11 minutes left in some questions in the chat that's pretty much i know there is another slide and i'll, I'll scam i'll skim through it quickly i'll just say look chase your dreams and then i think this is the last one so Poor format structure. These are just mistakes. Um, not proofreading it. No numbers. Quantify everything where possible. If I don't see numbers in a resume, I'm terrified. Everything yeah. is quantifiable. Um, instead of listing a skill, provide an example. There's no point in telling me I'm an amazing leader. Show it, you know, as in Liz touched on that earlier. Prove every key, key skills, 16 key skills in a resume. How is that possible? You know, don't overdo the key skills. And instead of mentioning key skills, try to give an example of you applying that skill. It's much more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, results. Uh, is your resume dull and boring? It's, uh, just keep an eye out for that. I talked about the magic formula. We won't go into that again. Uh, relying on agencies. Listen for these excuses. I didn't have time. That person didn't respond to me. I didn't see a suitable job posting. Those things are cop-outs. If you are using any of those excuses, it's on you. You need to figure it, you're the problem, not the, not, not, not the situation. And then that's pretty much it. So, I mean, invite people to go to moving to Canada, create a free account. There's a lot of settlement. If you're not in Canada just yet, there's a lot of useful resources there. Outpost is construction and engineering specific. I cannot help you if you're in another sector, um, but there's a lot of very specific construction and engineering advice there. And one ask for today, if you enjoyed the thing is, just please leave us a review on Google. Uh, we don't have a lot of Google reviews. So that's the one thing I ask people if you enjoyed today, just take the time for me to go on to, I think you can go to Google Maps and you click the moving to Canada icon and you just leave a positive review. So that's the lot. I know we went five minutes over, but we still have 10 minutes for questions.
Yeah, we're still good. Thank you so much for that, Rory. There is so much valuable insights there, I think. And I think one of my favorite things about you is the your tell it like it is kind of uh, personality. There's no mincing words, which is great. Um, so Ritu is asking, would mentioning industry specific market insights on an application help? Um, I don't know if that's enough detail for you. I think it was back when we were talking about project information, that kind of thing on a resume. Um, industry specific insights. That sounds like it's not really relating to is it Rita's specific experience. So like, you know, providing market commentary should be the job of a market commentary and not your resume, right? So if if you have experience delivering those market insights or you have the skills to act on those, yes. But it sounds like you're like it's got to be relevant to your skill set. I guess is the answer. Not just something you can Google, essentially, and stick on a resume, something that you actually know. Um, okay, great. We've got another question from Mary saying, does relevant international experience have weight in as far as a hiring manager or a hiring decision is it concerned? Do hiring managers look at international experience? Of course. Um, it really depends on the position, right? All of, all of the employers I work with are actively looking for newcomers. Most employers are waking up right now, but sadly, there are some employers who are very reluctant. They would prefer to leave a role open for two months, looking for the unicorn with local Canadian experience, then give that person who has uh, perfect international experience a chance. So this is the challenge, right? It really annoys me. I call it a form of systemic uh, racism. Um, it's a bias. It's protectionist. But we can talk about all of the negative connotations that it has and how slow Canada has been to remove it, but let's focus on what's in our control. Let's focus on asking questions about adaptability. What can I do? Um, having informational interviews, it's on you. The informational interview is extremely powerful because if you are meeting a person in your industry and they can tell you what's what and say, look, you've got a big problem here you don't have this accreditation you need to focus on that you need to learn the soft skills in this role or x y and z go figure out that and just go act on that stuff don't just figure it out act on it everyone loves the the, the person with a plan or the person that's actually continuously improving yeah, I think another great part to add to that, too, that I advise clients on it, reach out to other international professionals that you can see are in your goal employment. They are more likely going to be willing to help you and talk with you, but also you're going to figure out how did they do it? How what did they learn? What courses did they take? Who did they speak to? All of that kind of information. And they've walked the path already. So instead of trying to make a new path for yourself, follow the footprints of somebody else. Yeah, your your diaspora in Canada is going to be your biggest cheerleader. So I always encourage people to look and it, it doesn't matter as in immigrants will always help other immigrants. But just think of your specific diaspora. Is there a chamber of commerce or is there a business association for my diaspora? Is there a Facebook group where I can ask these questions and always focus on your diaspora first, because that's something you have a common ground. Then look at wider immigrants and then think of maybe contacting, you know, search for other people and you'll see, you'll recognize Look, Canada is full of immigrants. That's the irony of the local experience, right? As in, it's still so hard just to win. But once you get that first job, everything changes. It's like you're in a storm and then six months into your new job, it's blue skies and you realize I've actually created an amazing set of skills that I'm going to continue to use in my career going forward. So all of these skills are transferable to your career and life. Perfect. What's your advice on putting references directly on the resume? Do not. References, it just assume that it's part of applying for a professional job. Uh, do not put them in. Don't put reference letters either. You're just confusing a job hunter all they care about is your suitability for the job um i don't even i don't even recommend there's nothing on the bottom of um of my template saying references on request just assume that you know mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. professional employer is going to ask for a reference so don't waste space writing references available on request or their contact mm -hmm. information or attaching a testimonial they didn't ask you for a testimonial they asked for your resume so perfect um, what about dumbing down your experience? So reducing your level of experience um, for positions. This is a challenging question. I'd love to hear what your perspective is. 
Yeah, trying to answer that on the fly. I, it really, I it, it really <laughs> depends on the context, right? As in, I my my heart sinks when I kind of hear of people dumbing things down. I'll give you that example of you know we've made some amazing hires. We love hiring newcomers, as in there's lots of companies that love hiring newcomers. Um, it's it's an attitudinal thing that has to change in Canada, but it has to change from our policymakers there. They're creating this bureaucracy. Employers are following that. Um, so dumbing yourself, dumbing your skills down, I would never recommend. I would say your experience as is, but being able to take a step down shows a lack of ego and an actual um, a recognition of the learning curve, you know, but you don't have to immediately take a step down. It really depends on what industry and sector this person is working on. So I'm very reluctant to give a generic thing, but I would plead with people not to dumb it down. I, I don't think you should have to, but I think you need to find the right interview. I'll give the example of you know, our, um, um, our hire from India and he was he got rejected by all of these top level companies and he came along and he applied to us. And I'm like, I don't care where you're experienced because to me, marketing is in India is the same as marketing in Ireland is the same as Canada. So um, newcomers hire newcomers. So leave with that as well. Just think of how do I find access to these people? And even I'm seeing a lot more um, newcomers in HR now. And guess what? They're a lot more open, right? It's the, there's a lot of HRs and it's, um, it seems to be you know, changing. It's getting a lot more diverse. It's, it's looking more like immigration to Canada. And guess what? They're actually understanding what a journey that you've gone through. They're understanding the power of having a conversation. Um, my biggest goal as a recruiter is to convince my clients to have a conversation even when you're not hiring because the power of a five to ten minute conversation just chat me through your resume and saying we don't have a position right now but we'll be on to you as soon as we do that's how you build a pipeline but sadly our HR professionals are so myopic they're constantly busy uh, doing what I'm not too sure if they're not hiring and there's a lot of open roles but they're overlooking newcomers and they should be embracing and starting to learn more about these people and kind of saying hey I'm going to actually encourage you um, do you know what your communication skills could be improved but if you keep practicing this you'll get that better or the way you answer this question um, I would recommend changing that it's, it's all about helping people get better and mm. uh, I think that HR have a critical role in this because they've realized how can we have a labor shortage at a time where we have um, newcomers that are dramatically underemployed in this country. It's a tragedy and it's something that we're all working on, you know, mm -hmm. and we have to work from different sides, right? We're going to work on the policy side. We're going to work on the employer and each mm -hmm. one of the newcomers tonight, they got to realize with the message that they are in control of their job search. And when you get that job, this is something I coach all of my clients on, hire a newcomer. When you get in that position of power, you hire a newcomer yourself, and then we'll be able to just overthrow this whole system. But that's just the little fighter in me. Um, the next question is, how do you address a gap on your resume? Um, you know, do they, are as an employer going to be wondering, you know, what was the person doing from that last job to now? Um, I would address the gap the same as I would work experience, you know, it's just have the time range and just say, you know, travel, global travel or say time out due to illness or childbirth. Yeah, Parenting. childbirth. It, it is what it is. Um, the idea is there shouldn't be if there's question marks on your resume, you're not communicating yourself properly. So if there's a if there's a three year gap on your resume and you haven't addressed it, do not blame the hiring manager for just opting. Wait a minute, there's a candidate here who doesn't have gaps. So mm -hmm. this is a communication exercise to keep reiterating that as in. Um, so yeah, gaps in your resume, deal with them head on. What was the challenge? You know, if you got laid off and you couldn't find a job, focus, you know, it was a sabbatical uh, while finding work or try and give mm -hmm. some reasoning. But they kind of say anything over six months is kind of uh, is kind of alarming, right? So, you know, but try and explain it. Try and have that flow through the document because that flow explains you and who you are. You probably learned a lot from any sabbatical you had from work. 
And a lot of it could be travel. I mean, if you guys are coming here, you're going through the process of visas, everything like that, that that can be easily explained. We are, Rory and I, we're trying real hard to stay to 7.30. We're one minute over. Are you okay to answer maybe two more questions, Rory? Yeah, we'll go for it, yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, one real quick one is, if your education is 30 years ago, should you put the year of your education on your resume? I would favor doing it. I would favor not hiding your age because if you you're letting people kind of jump to conclusions and things like that, I would let present you as you and it's up to an employer. Sometimes if you hide those things, they kind of understand, okay, this person is very cautious about this. So I always recommend people, you know, let someone hire you for who you are. You know, you don't need to pretend to be somebody else. Or I know we say hide, hide your weaknesses, but that to me is kind of being a little bit, um, you know, I talked earlier about not mentioning the location of your work. It's actually being a little bit uh, deceptive is the word. So don't mm -hmm. you know, put it in there. It, it is what it is. You've got a wealth of experience and you've still got plenty of time in your career. So people will hire you for the wealth of experience that you have. And when you get to the interview, they're going to see that you're not 25. So, you know, why not check it in there? Um, OK, one last question. Um, one I'm just going to address quickly is Juby saying, you write a long text. It says leadership skills, et cetera, take up a lot of room on a CV. One of the skills is to be concise. Now, if you're in a leadership position, if you're in a management position, if you're a project coordinator, communication skills are key. And part of those communication skills is being concise. So it, you need to make sure that you're concise on your resume as well. You don't need to write a story. You need to quickly be able to demonstrate those skills in one or two lines. And if you work on it, you'll be able to do it. Um, the last question is, with respect to infusing personality in your resume, how do you do that without sounding too casual? Uh, with respect to what personality? Infusing personality on oh. your resume. How do you do it without being too casual? Ooh, uh, without being too <laughs> casual. I think what you need to focus on really is the, the traits, the personality traits that make you successful in a work environment, right? Um, if you are, I'm just trying to think of something, you know, like if you're extremely funny, I don't think I would be sharing that on a resume, right? It'll probably come true in your personality but like being funny isn't really an attribute of for success in a lot of roles right it can be very it can be a very powerful skill but it's probably not something that i would put on your professional summary right so i would really study what are the attributes that you display the most and that's probably chatting with uh, again, an informational interview is probably somebody who can read you better than others. A recruiter can read you, your past employers, and your your close friends. You know, what are the skills that you you feel make me successful in my career? Mm -hmm. I think it's great too. The other thing is that you don't have to be Mister Personality or Mrs. Personality on your resume naturally, I would say all of us have two to four qualities of us that are exceptionally strong. So whether that is being a team player, whether that is good communication skills, whether it is leadership skills, focus on those and demonstrate those on your resume. And then when you get the call, you're going to be able to extend your personality in that interview setting. So it's not about, you know, trying to show them that you're the life of the party. It's more about really leveraging the skills that stand out in you, being able to recognize what those are, and then really demonstrating them on your resume as long as they're relevant to the posting, you know, and, and just making sure that you're matching some of those key qualifications from the job posting. Yeah, that's great. And there's free personality tests online. If you're, if you don't know, if you don't know what makes you good, but I think that's a last resort, but yeah. I would chat to a previous employer and say, what attributes made me successful in this job? And you know what? They'd love to tell you that and they'll wish you well. And then you can also have the conversation about, hey, I'm job hunting in Canada. I might be uh, looking for a reference in the next few weeks. Mm, that's great. And essentially, the rest of them are a lot of thank yous. There is one question. Why is it difficult for employers in Canada to employ overseas employees? This is a question that we're all working really hard to try to solve right now. So, um, Rory, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I can address it. Um, we're actually, I'm, we're actually finding lots of people jobs before they arrive right now. The pandemic really helped that. What was happening was 
Canadians, like I have to be, I'll be very careful how I say this, but Canadians are a very conservative bunch. Okay. It's a huge country, the second biggest country in the world with a very, very small population. And they are a very conservative bunch in terms of innovating. Um, I got a letter from Revenue Canada today, it told me to respond by fax. And I'm like, I just roll my eyes at some of the the lack of innovation in this country. We're still using checks. We respond by fax. Um, there's a lot of very backwards things in this country, but there's a lot of opportunity as well. So the pandemic um, gave a jolt of energy to employers that, hey, you know what? You can't just call people into the office when they arrive, right? Because um, that's one of my pet peeves. I present an amazing candidate and my client goes, oh, tell him to come see us when he arrives. And I'm like, he'll have a job. You know, we are in a labor shortage right now. So I would tell people that if you are international job hunting, that there is a strong results focused resume will probably have you hired before you arrive. So mm. it's like, are you job hunting in the right way? Um, because we help people through moving to Canada. We're able to get casual work for people. We do have some job opportunities through moving to Canada in hospitality, in terms of casual work. Um, we plan to add a lot more jobs in the in the near future in 2024. But our mission is to have jobs for newcomers because there's a whole niche of employers that actually want to hire newcomers and you're mm -hmm. what we want to do is we want to find those employers for people rather than putting you out to the market and saying i'm applying for jobs that i'm fully competent in but i'm getting ghosted i'm not getting a response i don't know why i'm getting a response it happens to everyone in this market and it's nonsense mm -hmm. it's something that we have to eradicate mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for this, Rory, and thank you for, for your time. Uh, and there was also a thank you for your radical honesty, which I think is actually quite refreshing. So at least in my opinion, and I am not a conservative Canadian. Um, but with that being said, we're going to end the session for tonight. I thank you all for attending. I will be sharing the recording. It'll come out tomorrow. Um, and we're going to be sending information about how to contact moving to Canada, outpost recruitment if necessary. The templates for the resumes will come out. Um, and then moving forward, take this time to spend on your resumes, upgrade it so that you're sending out less applications that are stronger to get you in front of those employers. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks so much, everyone. And don't forget to leave a review. That's the one. Yes, and leave the review. <laughs> and if you're a candidate for career Pass, please reach out. There are a lot of us that are waiting to help you find that job that you're looking for with some funding from the Canadian government as well. And Liz, I don't mind you sharing my email information as well. So if people want to connect on LinkedIn okay. and send me an email, just be patient. As in, uh, I may get a lot of emails. So just be patient and I'll try to respond as best I can. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.